Good evening. I'm Stephanie Street, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. Thank you all for joining us this evening for the virtual continuation of our speaker series, Bridge Builders, Conversations with Interesting People, presented by the Clinton Foundation and Colson Oil. This evening, our panel will include Ms. Camille Schreier, Ms. America 2020, and four faith leaders who are committed members of the Clinton Health Matters Initiative's Opioid Response Network. They will discuss the tragic impact of the opioid crisis, which claims the lives of more than 130 Americans each day. We are incredibly grateful to all of you for your important work on this issue, and we'll look forward to hearing from each of you in just a few moments about your incredible efforts. The Clinton Foundation's Opioid Response Network fights the opioid epidemic by increasing education and awareness to decrease stigma and to curb addiction, while providing communities with the tools they need to combat this epidemic and to save lives. Now on a personal note, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Camille Schreier last December when I served as a preliminary judge for the Miss America Scholarship Competition. I was proud to participate in the first competition in the new era of Miss America, where the focus is really on empowering young women across our country to be the best they can be through leadership, talent, communication skills, and social impact advocacy. Camille was very impressive. A graduate of Virginia Tech with degrees in biochemistry and systems biology, a doctor of pharmacy student, and a certified naloxone trainer. She had already established herself as a serious and a serious and really passionate practitioner of her social impact initiative, Mind Your Beds, which is a program that focuses on drug safety and abuse prevention. Camille, we are really looking forward to hearing more from you this evening about how you're carrying out your job as Miss America. And yes, Miss America is a full-time job, but really wanna hear how you're doing this during this unprecedented um, COVID-19 pandemic as you endeavor to uh, educate communities across our country on the opioid epidemic. It is now my pleasure to turn the conversation over to my wonderful colleague, Chris Thrasher. Chris serves as the Senior Director of Substance Abuse Disorders and Recovery at the Clinton Foundation. And he has served as an important thought leader and voice in this space. And his leadership has brought this unique group of community leaders together tonight. So Chris, I'm gonna kick it over to you please to introduce our panel and begin our conversation. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Presidential Center, we want to once again, especially thank all of you for attending this Bridge Builders event, addressing really one of the most devastating epidemics that we've ever faced, the opioid epidemic. Now, why can the faith-based community make a real difference in addressing this? Well, because this epidemic affects all of us, regardless of our age, our race, our sexual identity, our creed, our disability or ability status, veteran status, uh, you know, religion, lack of religion, it really affects all of us and it's going to require all of us working together. It truly will take a village. It's gonna take healthcare professionals and providers. It's gonna take parents, it's gonna take families, public policymakers, researchers, law enforcement, really the fabric of the American community working together. And the faith-based community, I think is the glue that holds all of us together. Because what we do know is that one plus one plus one is far greater than three. You know, Sunday is still the most segregated day of the week, which really provides both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, we know that a, a third of us attend religious services weekly. And individuals often turn to their faith leaders in times of crisis. I often say that faith leaders are in what I would almost call a long-term relationship with some of their congregants. And you know, that long-term relationship with their congregants really allows them to detect signs of distress, but only if they're comfortable and confident to do so. You know, there's a real hesitation for many to seek help, but it's important for faith leaders to take the initiative and begin the dialogue when and where possible, because we know that faith leaders have this unique ability to foster change and shape and 
influence and inform the attitudes that so often contribute to inequities. Our faith leaders have this ability to educate, to motivate, mobilize. They enlighten us. They equip us sometimes with the skills and the resources that we need to find hope in sometimes what seems like hopeless situations. You know, changing the mindset that addiction is not a moral failing, but rather a treatable disease is going to be absolutely key in fighting and beating this epidemic. And so I would like to introduce our panel for tonight's conversation and then turn it over to Miss America, Camille Schreier, who is going to have what I know will be a fascinating conversation with our four panelists. Our first panelist in no particular order is the Reverend Dr. Von Shuri Wrighton. Uh, Vaughn is the State Opioid Treatment Authority in the state of Georgia's Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, and he also serves as the senior pastor for a local AME church in Atlanta, Georgia. Our second panelist is the Reverend Dr. Joanna Siebert, who is a retired pediatric radiologist and a deacon in the Episcopal Diocese of Arkansas for 19 years and presently serving at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Little Rock. Our third panelist is the Rabbi Jonathan Lubliner, who is the spiritual leader of the Jacksonville Jewish Center in Northern Florida, where he has held the congregation's Jack F. Shorstein Senior Rabbinic Chair for the past 16 years. And our fourth and final panelist is Imam Basim Hamid, who is a practicing physician specializing in neurology and pain management. And he is also the founder of the Wasat Institute and Imam at the Islamic Center for Greater Houston. So Miss America, Camille, thanks so much for being here again. And I am so excited to turn it over to you, uh, as I said, to what I know will be a fascinating conversation. So Miss America, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Christian, for those wonderful introductions. And thank you, Stephanie, as well, for your introduction at the beginning. And I just want to take a moment before we start to thank you all, all four of you, for taking the time to join me here tonight to talk about this really incredibly important issue. Um, Miss America has given me the opportunity to advocate across the country to fight this battle on opioid addiction, which I didn't fully understand um, until I entered pharmacy school. And I was sharing that with you a little bit before we began. And the more and more that I learn about the opioid epidemic, the more I know that we have to keep talking about it. And I can only do so much um, from my end. And the biggest thing that we are able to do as a community is find leaders in our own communities who are able to kind of be that liaison and be that support system for people that are affected. So I'm really excited to have this discussion with you. And the first thing that I wanna talk about is science and faith. That is something that I get asked about all the time. Um, I'm a huge believer that addiction is a disease and it should be treated like one. There's so much scientific research that goes around addiction. Um, and as someone who is studying science myself and loves science, I get asked because I'm also a woman of faith, how am I able to balance those two things? How am I able to discern um, really the differences in the way that these two things meld? So I would love to hear your experiences. And Dr. Sieber, I'm gonna pick, at, pick you out first because I know that you are a physician and have um, some background in this. So I would love to hear your experience. Thank you so much, Camille. Well, I, uh, I never had a, any difficulty uh, uh, blending that my faith and science uh, because of my uh, uh, background in science. Uh, but uh, as a uh, also now as a minister, I, uh, I feel that part of our job is to heal mind, body, and spirit. Uh, and so I'd spent uh, the first part of my career uh, healing the uh, body part and hopefully a little bit of the mind and spirit and so uh, now I'm concentrating a little bit more uh, but now it's all three uh, with the uh, with uh, the opioid. That's amazing. I love that approach because I think that honestly when we look at a lot of issues in our life approaching it from a mind body and spiritual perspective I think can be 
a really great tactic in, in a lot of different issues. Um, Dr. Hamid, you have also a, a uh, background as a physician, so I'm curious of your perspective as well. Certainly, and first I would like to thank everyone for giving me this great opportunity to be here. Thanks for the Clinton Foundation and for Miss America for hosting this. Um, as a physician, went through a lot of courses of science and it became evident to me that God operates in this universe through science. Science is the manifestation of the almighty God in everything we do, from the creation of the universe as at a universal level to the micro level at our individual bio cells. And for everything we see in life, there is a law that God has dictated. And when these laws are broken, diseases ensue. And addiction is nothing but breaking some of the laws of the uh, biochemistry, pharmacology, physiology of our being. And that goes back to the fact that Dr. Seibert has pointed out, we cannot treat the human being as separate units as a physical body. It's all has to be a holistic approach, engaging a spiritual, mental, and physical being. And as a such, we are servants of God in these three aspects and not one individual aspect. And yes, the connection to God has to be manifested physically, spiritually, and mentally. That's amazing. Absolutely. I think that's so true. And um, Dr. Lubliner, or Rabbi, Rabbi Lubliner, sorry, I'm, I, you know, I'm gonna, I can't leave you out. So what are- I'm the only non-doctor here <laughs> of one kind or another. Um, but some of my best friends are doctors. Um, thank you, um, Camille, and, and to also uh, my fellow panelists for, for being here. Um, I, I agree with um, what has been said so far, but I would, I would take it from a little bit of a different perspective, and that is long before we had a modern concept of science, we still understood that there was uh, an emotional and spiritual aspect to healing. Um, chaplains played um, a, a great role in, in the military, administering comfort to the wounded. Um, the uh, those who were uh, monks in the medieval period were often um, uh, doctors of medicine, um, albeit uh, medicine of a very different kind. And I just know from um, my own parishioners beyond the opioid epidemic and in, in any mm -hmm. kind of, of illness and substance abuse is an illness like any other where there is um, a strong sense of, of purpose, of faith, a belief in, in God, a belief in self. Um, there are the, all of these emotional and spiritual intangibles that can make a huge difference in a person's recovery, whether that's a recovery from cancer or um, a recovery from substance abuse. And granted, the, the pharmacology, the neurology of substance abuse is very different. Um, but the, I have watched people really beat the odds in, in the most uh, difficult of situations medically um, on the strength of the, the spiritual attitude and their, their beliefs. And by the same token, I've seen people who have given up, um, who physically go downhill. So there really is a kind of bio-psychic unity between our biology and um, our psychology and our, and our spiritual side. That's really interesting. And, and I absolutely, the biochemistry is a huge part of it. And that's kind of what I'm always interested in, but it is important to kind of go back to that holistic piece of it. And Dr. Or Dr. Wright, and you're, you're back with us now. I know we lost your connection for just a moment. Um, and I think you're on mute. So I'd like I am to back. I am awesome. back. Hi, welcome back. Um, we'd love to hear your perspective, um, kind of how you're able to balance the idea of science of addiction and disease with your faith. Well, 
I consider myself somewhat of a neurotheologist. So, so, so that, and, and, and I believe that, 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 that my faith backs that perspective up um, because addiction is a, is a brain disease. And, and from the moment many of us are even born and the, and the concept and the idea of God begins to change our brain. And, and so, and so the, the, and, and when, and as we learn new things, new synapses form in, in our brains all the time. And so we, and so the, the, so we, we understand that, that when we talk about in our faith, when we talk about renewing our minds and, you know, that we're dealing with, you know, the mind as, as it is because, you, and, and so, and God, and just even sometimes when you're meditating, meditation is a way that, you know, even if it was God wasn't even involved, meditation is a way that impacts the way your, the neurons in your brain fire. Um, exercise is a way that it impacts the way that your brain, the neurons in your brain fires. Um, prayer is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a way in which it impacts the way in which your brain, the neurons in your brain fires and new synapses are formed and new habits are formed. And so, and so when we think, when we talk about addiction, we understand that, that it's a brain disease and, it, and definitely that impacts the way that the neurons and the neurotransmitters in your brain are, are functioning. And so the addiction, and you can tell, you know, all the research that has been done already, you, we can tell that, 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 you know, through the PET scans that, that, it, that certain drugs of addiction impact certain neurons and neurotransmitters in, in the brain. So, so there is, a, there is that, that combination uh, for, for me as I, as I do that. And, and so my responsibility as a faith leader has been to, um, to share that type of information. Sometimes I, I share on Sundays that type of information, even, I'm not, even if I'm not talking about addiction, I'm talking about behavior, but I'm also talking about the way that our brain works. And so the science of our brain and the science of, of, of the, you know, of how we, how those things interact and our faith interacts is very important. It's very important. So, and then we think about addiction. Addiction is a biopsychosocial spiritual disease. Um, because one of the things that, that happens in addiction is you lose the connectedness, which is a spiritual aspect of who we are as human beings. That's why you see even now during the COVID experience right now, many people are suffering from different mental health challenges in, in because of the isolation, because of the lack of connectedness. And so it's a, and then when people begin to recover and they get into recover, it's through that reestablishment of the connectedness that, that, that's really important. You know, the connectedness, not just to God, but the connectedness to other human beings and to the things that they once enjoy and brought meaning to their life. So that's the way that I think about it. That's the way I approach it. That's awesome. And I will say from a pharmacy perspective, I'm always interested in non-pharmacological interventions for treating certain conditions, which I think people have a perception of those of us who are in medicine and healthcare that we're looking to just give another pill to a person to make them better or cure them of something. But taking those kind of mind and spiritual approaches, things like prayer and meditation that quite literally don't have any side effects. The only effects are probably going to be good ones um, and things that aren't going to put more chemicals into people's bodies um, and allow them to kind of be more self-sufficient in managing the issues that they do have. And you brought up a really good point that I wanted to talk about is, you know, we're in this place right now. Um, we're going through this COVID pandemic. Everyone's lives have changed for the past three or four months. It's been really chaotic. So I want to talk a little bit about mental health because I think that mental health is a huge piece of what feeds into the opioid epidemic. Um, so what are ways within your ministries are you able to promote mental health um, with those around you? Um, and how are you able to balance that with your faith? So I maybe we'll just start in the same order. So Dr. Siebert, would you like to start? Thank you so much, Camille. I, I wanted to just emphasize uh, something that everyone here has said, and also uh, Stephanie and, and Chris as well, and you, that um, to uh, see uh, addiction, as a disease rather than a moral failing. Uh, this, that simple concept is a huge stumbling block to so many people uh, going into uh, trying to reach uh, recovery. And if, if people can just recognize just that one statement, it's a disease, not a moral failing, then this whole seminar is worthwhile, tremendously worthwhile. 
that, uh, so uh, thinking about uh, at, at our church, uh, we've uh, really com combined mental uh, health and addiction together, and we do uh, a lot uh, uh, concentrating uh, on, uh, on the addictive part. And so we've had, uh, we have a recovery Sunday. Uh, we have a speaker at our, our formation. Uh, we have a 12-step uh, Eucharist. We have a recovery retreat. So uh, we've been, uh, been active for some time in, in recovery. But um, what we've learned through this seminar with the uh, uh, Clinton Foundation is uh, how to look at it from a standpoint of uh, uh, of opioids, and that's where that we were not we we did not have that piece in, did not have that piece in, and so we've learned a whole lot uh, through our seminars about uh, the opioid addiction and and what to do. Uh, in essence, uh, we. Uh, we have a speaker about Narcan, and uh, that speaker also came to our church. And then uh, uh, we had a um, a um, resolution for our the whole diocese of Arkansas that every church should have Narcan at the church, and which passed. Uh, and uh, we also uh, gave out Narcan and uh, told people how to use it at our convention. So that's kind of. Uh, we've learned so much, um, uh, and there's so much more. I'm not going to say more. We've learned so much through this seminar that we've all attended. That's, a, that's amazing, and I'm particularly excited that you gave everyone Narcan. That's something that I talk a lot about throughout this year. There is also a stigma associated with Narcan because people don't understand what Narcan does, um, and they don't understand why they should maybe have it or how to use it. I actually carry it with me at all times, and disclaimer if you think that you can use narcan on yourself you can't you're really using it like um if you were cpr certified and that's kind of what i compare it to you're going to be that first first responder um so i love that you guys have done that and i i remember when i heard about this entire initiative um i, I was really interested to know how the faith leaders were going to be able to use that within their their own ministries and so thank you for sharing that with me too that's also i was going to ask all of you how you're able to do this within your ministries um i'm going to go to dr hamid just talking a little bit more about kind of mental health within your congregation how are you able to balance that um with what you do normally so the muslim community in the united states camille is very complex it's not homogeneous we have a great segment that is immigrant population then you have the second third and maybe the fourth generation if you look at the mental health concept in general that is that was a big taboo even in this country i mean uh, i remember um being invited to a hospital in Wisconsin to speak. It's a VA hospital and it was in the middle of nowhere. And I asked, why is this? I would never expect to see a hospital there. And they said, well, this was a psych hospital decades ago and psych hospitals had to be remote from the urban areas because of uh, the taboo related to it. So in our community, we still struggle with a taboo about mental health disorders but more so related to addiction, obviously. But things have improved quite a lot. And I have uh, to tell you that since this initiative started with the Clinton Foundation, we opened up a lot of doors. Uh, it became a regular talk in our Friday sermons, educating people about mental health. This coming September would be the first Muslim mental health conference actually held in Houston, this is the first of its kind in the country, and addiction is gonna be a big part of it. Um, it seems like it's gonna be on Zoom, <laughs> unlike the way it was planned first. Uh, now, uh, one of the other major actually benefits that I myself benefited, benefited from, from the Clinton Foundation, we were able to bring the drug take back day. 
uh, your, you know, your initiative is great, mind your myths. This is something similar, actually. I, as a physician, believe it, I didn't know this existed. This is a regular event that, that is held twice a year by the DEA, and Clinton Foundation brought it to us as a gift, actually, and at no effort, almost, all we had to do advert it. And I can tell you that this event has served a very passive, non-threatening, easy way to raise awareness around mental health uh, uh, disorders in general, but particularly about uh, addiction. Because people are asking, why are we doing this? People ask, and on social media, even uh, in the mosque, why are we doing this in the mosque? So we had to do conversations, we had to do talks. And people, believe it or not, open up and say, well, I'm glad you're doing this. And I have so many people come to me and talking about their addiction problems or about loved ones who have suffered from addiction. And many mosques, it's like a chain reaction. When they see one mosque opened up and started the topic, the other mosque would do the same. And we were able to du duplicate that in the Islamic Society of the Greater Houston Organization. Over 20 mosques are now doing this on an annual basis. And it became like a cornerstone of, their, uh, of the curriculum and what they preach from the pulpit on mental health disorders and on addiction particularly. That's amazing. And it's interesting to think of the cultural perspective. Um, I know that in, in other communities and especially in other countries, we've, got, we've come so far in the United States, but especially in a community that is so immigrant based as well, how different that can be. Um, and how wonderful to be able to kind of break those doors open through this. And the drug take back piece excites me more than you can know, because that is something that I preach constantly to keep things out of your house that you don't need. You know, that's a good lesson for all of us with all of, we probably have too much stuff in our house to begin with, but getting rid of those potentially dangerous medications, whether or not it's to prevent poisonings for our children um, or prevent abuse potential for people in our homes or even, even sometimes if people come in our homes that we invite guests over to make sure that they're staying safe. And so I love that you're doing that and kind of opening that up to your community. Um, so Rabbi, you are next up. I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, one of the things that I started doing after um, I was trained on Narcan at the uh, the Clinton Health Initiative here in Jacksonville um, was to uh, to get a second um, dose of Narcan, which I keep on my desk, which um, has become something of a conversation piece. Not for everybody. People sometimes don't notice it, but then. For people who do know what it is, they look at it and quizzically, it's a conversation starter, if nothing else, which gives me an opportunity to um, to share information uh, without uh, making assumptions or without preaching. So sometimes it is a person for whom the interest is more than passing, um, but even for the person who is just interested only in passing. It's it's educational in a in a in a good way, um, like Dr. Hamid, in the Jewish community there certainly is still stigma, um, a sign of um, you know having gone astray, went off the road, um, that there is a, a sense of um, personal failure. It may not even be something that people are consciously aware of. Uh, but but when you say substance abuse disorder, um, they don't think of it or hear it in the way if you had said, oh, well, she was diagnosed with diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, there is a non-judgmental uh, nature to the reaction that you don't have when when you are telling somebody that you have a substance abuse disorder. Granted, I believe things are better than they once were, but it's all a matter of, of um, you know, shades and gradations and degrees of, of change. We're certainly not there yet. In, um, in our congregation, um, there is more of this than people realize. 
um, because of my commitment to clergy confidentiality. Um, I cannot share, but um, some of my congregants would be very surprised to know um, who has or, or who doesn't have uh, a substance abuse problem. And some of them um, have abuse issues and are in fact um, fully functional. And that's another myth that uh, you can't, you know, you, you have to be in some back alley and you have to be uh, down and out on, on a street corner. That's, that's simply, you know, not true. Um, so we try to, to create awareness and treat the stigma both directly and indirectly. When I say directly, I mean we have literature that's um, out. I have books that I give to people who come into my office. Um, I certainly have, have preached sermons on the issue of, of substance abuse. Uh, as well as the on the solution end of things, not only destigmatizing it, um, but I was listening to NPR today and a very disturbing report um, on NPR about treatment centers that have no licensing. You have to be a, to be a beautician in pretty much every state. You need a license, uh, but there are these um, treatment centers that have run off the rails that need no licensing you know, whatsoever, and who often receive um, you know, Medicare and, and, and Medicaid reimbursements for, for the services that they render. So um, there is the, uh, the direct dealing and sensitizing of the issue, but even indirectly, I am a big believer that the 12 steps is a program for spiritual growth for everyone. And that isn't to take away from, from those who are using it uh, to, uh, to, to become sober and, and stay sober. Um, but if you, if you look at the, the, the spiritual aspects that are attached to, this, to the 12 steps, they truly are steps for making and turning yourself into a better human being, a more connected human being, a more sensitive human being, a more humble human being. And very often, um, some of the greatest spiritual teachers that I have ever met are folks who have gone through um, recovery. And um, I, I want my congregants to understand that um, 12 step programs uh, and, and wrestling with growing and getting beyond whatever it is that is trapping you and holding you in place, that is something we all face as human beings. If, if perhaps more of us could have a sense of those with substance abuse disorders, um, wrestling with something very, very human maybe it wouldn't seem so strange and maybe people would be a little less judgmental. They'd be able to look that other person in the face and see themselves. Absolutely. That's true. I mean, and you know, it's interesting you talk about the 12 step programs in terms of treatment and I've heard people, you know, on both sides saying that, you know, these programs are effective. And then there's other people that I've, there, I was at a, at a conference a couple months ago when it was when I was still traveling and this one man, he was so, so um, sure. He's like, pr treatment programs that do not have faith basis, I, he did not feel were effective. And it's interesting because my, I, I had a lot of questions with that because I'm so focused on the science and so many pieces. But the more and more that I learn about how faith can be integrated within the treatment process, the more effective and more it makes sense really from a holistic perspective, kind of, of what we were talking about before. And I also love that you have Narcan on your desk because that's just really <laughs> warms my heart. To a I, I would I'd only just say one more thing, Camille, is that, is that um, I, I would never be so dogmatic if, if something keeps the next drink or the next pill um, or the next shot whatever it is that works for somebody, oh, whether it's faith-based or 12 steps or not, um, you know, wh whatever works for whomever is, is, uh, is effective. And I agree completely. It was just very interesting for me that this person was so adamant that he w was sure that without faith, you were not going to be able to recover from addiction. Um, 
And I had, that was kind of my first, you know, introduction to faith and addiction kind of blending together. So I wanted to share that because I was just really interested by that particular topic. And I think it's also interesting to talk about, you know, we talk about substance use disorders. We've said that a lot, but it's important to remember that those are not just opioids. Um, and that you mentioned this as well, that people, some people are addicted to opioids or other drugs and are completely functional and seem like everyone else. Um, and, it, you know, we have this perception as a society that those who are addicted to opioids are people that are, you know, doing heroin or doing really hard illicit drugs. And for the most, for most people who are facing substance use disorders, that's not the reality. Um, from alcoholism to prescription drug misuse, I mean, there's such a range of this. And, you know, we, we face a lot of these things in a similar way. Um, so I think that that's important as well to, it was a great point to recognize the fact that there's people who we meet every day who we don't know what they're going through. And that's something that I very much think about as Miss America, as I travel around and shake people's hands and I'm sharing this information and, and not knowing what they're going through or maybe what a family member is going through. So that's absolutely true as well. Um, Dr. Wrighton, um, yeah. would love to hear your thoughts as well. About about the mental health aspect of it, or the whole yes. just the whole thing. Well, mental well, me, health and how you're really you know incorporating this into your ministry. Well, well, let me say this to you all first. I, I heard some of the things that other people have said, and this is one of my quotes that I that I say often when I speak at conferences um, in the state of Georgia and other places. And I I tell people all the time that that recovery happens wherever God's grace falls, mm -hmm. and 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 that might be in the pastor's office that it's possible that that could happen on the street and what some of us have called the cat holes. Um, that, that can happen in a 12-step room. That can happen in a psychiatrist's office. That can happen in your house. That can happen in the church or in the mosque or in the temple, wherever. But wherever God's grace falls, that's when recovery begins to happen for that person. So there are many pathways that people have to recovery. I really, I really want people to understand that there are many pathways and there's no one set pathway for anyone. And, 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 and there are many prescriptions to healing. And so no matter what we promote, left or right, whatever makes a difference in this person's life, if they begin to get better, then that's the thing that we should support um, for, that, for that individual. Uh, when it comes to, I'm going to switch roles for you for a second. I, I am also the State Opioid Treatment Authority in Georgia. And, um, and, and so one of the things that, that we know in, in, in my role, and I've been doing this for over, over 30 years now as an addictions professional and, you know, a pastor. And, and so one of the things that, that I know is that when you talk about mental health and substance use disorders, the two go hand in hand. 98% of the individuals that, that we serve, that I've served over the years, have had both mental health disorders and substance use disorders, the co-occurring disorders, particularly among women. Just, just so you know, more often than not, women are more impacted by traumatic experiences than, than men. They have more, more trauma um, experience. Sometimes the men won't share that. I'm telling you this from a treatment perspective. From, from people that I've, that I've worked with over the years. I've worked in both women's treatment centers and in men's treatment centers. And so more often than not though, the experience has been that, that, that women have had more trauma because some of the things that have gone on have been more traumatic, sexual abuse, domestic violence, um, and, and other traumatic things that have taken place in, in their lives. Um, even, even from divorce in and of itself, these have been some traumatic moments in some, in some of these people's lives. And so all of these things, in many cases, um, you know, impact the mental health of, of some people. And, and of course, you, you know, you can talk about the predisposition that, that some people have and you, based on their family, family history and, and things like that as well. Predisposition for substance use disorders, predispositions for, for mental health. And all of these things, they all play a part in, in this. And so when people are doing... Um, you know, when, when individuals who have generally, we, we wrestle with trying to figure this one out. What, what comes first, the, the egg or the, or the chicken? You know, is it a mental health disorder or is it substance use disorder? And, and in the treatment world, they're often try wrestling with how to treat 
You know, what do we treat? We treat the mental health is disorder or do we treat the substance use disorder? Or can we treat both simultaneously? Okay. That, 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 this, is, this is important stuff because, because, because and, and, that, and that sometimes impacts funding and direction that, that how people will go and stuff like that. But, but nevertheless, um, this is what I do know is that if someone is decompensating in, in their mental health issue, then it's, 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 it's very difficult to treat the substance use disorder. You, you, you have to stabilize the mental health issue first before you can even begin to address the substance use disorder. You know, and, but if you never address the substance use disorder, then the mental health disorder will, will, you know, will be re, re, um, restarted by, by the beginning, by the use of substances again. So it's gonna come back. So anyway, in my, in my, in my faith tradition, we, what we do is, um, is, is we've educated our congregation, you know, and, and as my, as a pastor, being with this type of information, I continuously educate my congregation. As a matter of fact, once a month, we do this health and, and wellness recovery, you know, call that, that we invite, you know, the community to come and talk and dialogue about, about stigma, about health, about wellness, you know, about taking care of, uh, and Rabbi, you'll love this one, I think, about taking care of your entire nephish. You, you know, the entire, yeah, I know you would, I think you do too. <laughs> but that is the nephew, is the entire soul, the, the mind, the body, the, the entire being, you know, and, and, when you, and when you do that, then, you know, and we, we call it, how's your soul, you know, Be, because that's important. And, and so you begin to take care of the mental health and support the, the individuals as they talk about this. And, and as a faith leader, we, we stand in, um, in positions to influence that at least twice a week sometimes for some of us, you know, to have that impact. So I work on that every day in, in both my vocation, I'm bivocational in both my role as a state opioid treatment authority and as the pastor of, of the African, as the River of Life AME Church in Snellville, Georgia. I think it's really important what you just pointed out, really how complex addiction is really from kind of the mental health and then the addiction and this and the substance use disorder at the same time, that those are sometimes separate and happening at the same time and how you treat those things. I mean, it really is complex. And the more and more that I learn about this issue, the more complex I think it becomes. Um, and understanding how difficult it is to navigate if you are that person who's facing a substance use disorder maybe you don't know that you have an underlying mental health diagnosis and do you make which one is causing the other you're a hundred percent right and I think that sharing that and being aware of that um, is also really important um, and this kind of brings me to my next question is as a faith leader when someone from your uh, congregation comes to you and says, I have a substance use disorder and I am looking and seeking help. What are the ways that you are helping that person? What are some tactics that you use personally um, to support that person through that role? I'm gonna go with Dr. Seibert to scan first. Thank you, thank you so much, Camille. This is so exciting. Uh, I wish we could do this uh, more often. I love uh, being here. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to add one more thing about uh, uh, faith and, and addiction. And um, I, I so appreciate what uh, Jonathan said about 12 Steps for All, that uh, we just had a, a, a seminar this past month on that same subject, 12 Step Living for, for Everyone. Uh, the, uh, and one thing we do is uh, we have a communion service, a 12 Step Eucharist, uh, once a month, and it's to uh, let our people in our congregation who um, don't know anything about the 12 steps know that the 12 steps are very spiritual, uh, very spiritual thing. And, it, and on the other hand, it lets people in our congregation know who are struggling with addiction that our church really cares about them and, want, and wants to support them. Uh, as far as when someone comes to me, uh, I, I'm in recovery, and so I usually tell them my story. And then I take them to a meeting, and then I introduce them to some other people, uh, who uh, some in our church, some outside our church, that are in recovery. 
And then I set them up uh, a meeting with a counselor who can uh, help them decide uh, where, where they should go. Should they go into treatment or can they just, uh, and should it be inpatient, outpatient, uh, and then or just uh, start going to a 12-step program. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how, how we do that. Thank you. Of course, and that's a great tactic. Um, and thank you for sharing that you're in recovery as well. Um, I'm sure that you have a, a different kind of empathy toward those people because you have gone through that experience. So thank you for sharing that. Dr. Hamid? Yes, and I just want to point out, Dr. Wright, and that concept of nafis is the same in Arabic and Islam as well, which is another uh, proof to the theory that Jews and Muslims uh, are beyond cousins, they're brothers. So back to the question. Um, if someone comes to me uh, pointing out they have a problem with addiction, this is a sheep that has come to me and I didn't have to go after. Mm -hmm. So, And I wanna make sure that I keep that sheep. So the first thing I do is give them reassurance that they have come to the safe haven of God. They have come to the mosque, to the imam or to the authority, and we're not gonna fail them. And we're not going to abandon them no matter what. We're always going to be available for them. The second step is to give them hope that they have so many people who have gone that path before them and have recovered and have become celebrities and have done so well. So there is always hope. This is not the end of life. This is not the end of the world. After that, we start going through practical steps, either refer them to a, a counselor, or we have, we're lucky to have actually multiple psychologists and psychiatrists in the community. But I can tell you that one of the greatest things that came out of the initiative with the Clinton Foundation in Houston we were able to put together a resource guide actually that is available to us that lists every single organization, clinic, counseling uh, office that is available. So we present this to the uh, person and help him navigate through it. What's the best uh, resource that you can utilize to give him the fastest uh, recovery uh, now we have something equivalent to the 12 step program. It's the Muslim version of it, which is tailored and that is available. We have some resources actually that we present to them. But more important than the resources is surrounding them with this outpouring love, with the hope and with the grace and compassion of God that they are going to be forgiven and that guilt and remorse they're having should not be a reason for them to be sabotaged and ruined, should be nothing but an incentive and motivation to get better and recover. Very, very good approach. And the idea of the sheep is a great one to think about that when you get that person that comes directly to you, that's a really incredible moment because so many people are so afraid. Um, so to make sure that you keep that, um, keep that person, you know, close by you. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to remember that one too. Um, Rabbi. Well, um, you know, I, I agree with what Dr. Siebert and Dr. Hamid have, have said. Um, I will do everything I can to, to get the door that's open a little bit to open more because it's a tremendous act of, uh, of courage. Uh, the, the hardest part of uh, substance abuse, and, and I think the, uh, one of the worst symptoms, is the denial. And, you know, most other diseases, if you, you know you're sick, you immediately want to go to the doctor. This is the one where um, you don't want to go to the doctor because you, you realize, you know, you, you deep down somewhere know that something is terribly wrong that has to change, and you're fearful of that change. Um, we, have, we have congregants who um, have worked as sponsors. Um, I listen a lot uh, when somebody comes in. I, I, 
I, I don't do much talking at first. Um, I want to know where that person is at and respond uh, accordingly. Uh, and then to follow up, um, we, I've had many people who have taken three steps forward and then two steps back. Um, falling off the wagon is um, very often a part of the process. It's um, you know, more common than, than, than not. Um, and, and just to be there to, to say, I recognize that you're created in God's image. You have infinite value. God puts you on this earth for a reason. And, um, you know, if, if God has given you a soul and a place on, on this earth, then you are, you are precious. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm here to, to value you, not to judge you. Um, I think it's very important. Religion is so judgmental in so many ways that clergy can't afford to be judgmental uh, in that way when they're when they're talking with people about their 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 brokenness. Um, very often, it's it's actually the families that come in that speak to me. Um, people who might otherwise be in Al-Anon meetings, and 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 that's that's also uh, where there's a lot of listening. Very, very often it's a different tact because um, many of the folks that I'm dealing with are, are unfortunately enablers and it's very hard for them to be able to, uh, to, to step back. Um, but um, humility, love, respect, and listening are, I think that, that ecumenically is uh, across the board. And we too in Jacksonville, thanks to the Clinton Foundation, have um, a guide um, with resources and, and that helped plug a big hole. It was really just the world of treatment out there and me on the pulpit and how do I connect between the two? And um, uh, the Clinton Foundation, the, the, the initiative has really helped to create a bridge between the individual congregation and the larger treatment community and interfaith community so important to have those resources and i'm sure that it can be confusing for many people to know where they should go um, and it takes a lot of courage for a family especially to come to you um, but i think that that's one of the things that's so interesting about this entire program is having someone like a faith leader be that person because there's such a trust between people and the the people that they worship with that i think that it puts us or you all in is such a wonderful situation to be able to be the person to provide resources and i kind of feel that way as miss america because for some reason people tend to listen to me or trust me in a way that's a little bit more than normal which is really interesting because it's not really something that i expected through this role but i think that's why it's important when you're in a leadership position to be able to use the use your platform to be able to share those resources especially for issues like this so thank you for sharing that and uh Dr. Wrighton, how are you approaching people who are coming to you saying that they have substance use disorders? Well, um, I, I want to, I agree with everything that, that my colleagues have said so far. And, and, and I've used many of those approaches because um, I, have, I have members in my congregation that are, that are in recovery. I also have nurse, a nurse and, and, and members in my, in my congregation who you know, work on the mental health side of things. So um, we've actually worked to um, connect people to treatment, you know, through that, through that um, initiative that I was telling you about. And we've been pretty successful in doing that. One of the things that, that we do clearly is, is um, from the beginning is through my, through my guidance, through my team and, you know, and part of our, our part of our faith culture is we have created a, a non-judgment zone. When you walk into that door to that worship center, where we are, it's a non-judgment space. That's it. That judgment is not a part of our radical hospitality. That, that's, that's over with. So my whole congregation has that, that sense, and, and it comes from my leadership in, in that way. That's the way that I choose to lead, and I've influenced them in that way. Um, and I use often I use the tools that I've learned as a clinician, you know, as a pastoral clinician. I did clinical pastoral education work as a chaplain at, at Grady Memorial Hospital, and I've done you know substance use counseling for years. And so I use a lot of motivational interviewing. 
uh, motivational techniques, things that, you know, to, to, you know, that would help the person find their source of strength in, in this process as well, you know, and their source of hope in this process and, and then hold the family's hand all the way through the process and never disconnect from them and provide them with the resources. Um, here at, in, in Georgia, we've developed, you know, and my, my role as a state opioid treatment authority is, is, in, has been part of working with the Clinton Foundation to bring together these faith leaders that we've had around the table for nine months now. And we've developed the same resource toolkit for the Metro Atlanta area. And I, and I took it a step further and we, we developed a kit was not just a hard copy, but it's electronic as well, where, where we can pass it on through, through a link and, and individuals can just tap on the sites of different organizations and see the, faith, the places that they're gonna go to treatment and pick those places. And so it's, it's really loaded and it's, it's really productive. And we're gonna be able to tell from the metrics about how many people actually use it, what page they go on, how often they're doing this. And so it's a resource that's gonna go out throughout the entire state. And, um, and we've been really successful in doing that. And so that, that's some of the ways that I, that I do this though, is definitely that, that, non, that non-judgment is critical because as they said, it, it's a courageous thing mm-hmm. to admit that, that I'm struggling, that I'm dealing with this pain. And, and that I really need help. Mm-hmm. I can't do this on my own. And you need to be able to hear that as a pastor mm-hmm. and have a tremendous amount of compassion for the person sitting across that table from you. And people know when you love them and when you don't. Absolutely. And I think the idea of non-judgment is so important when we talk about faith communities because I think faith communities in in so many ways in this country have a reputation of being a judgmental place. Um, And I think that it's so important as faith leaders um, to create that community, to say, this is a no judgment zone. We love each other. We support each other through our struggles. And I think that that's something that really, especially right now through what we're going through from, you know, in social unrest, um, in, in all these cultural, you know, differences that are happening in our country. And we see this in the news right now, but also with addiction that we create that community of support and not judgment and understanding and listening. So thank you for being a leader in your, your congregation to create that environment, because I think that that is so incredibly needed. So thank you for sharing that as well. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And so I think that we're going to bring Stephanie back in. Well, thank you, Camille, for, for kicking it or handing the baton back to me. <laughs> um, and for, for those tuning in who have watched our Bridge Builders programs previously, you know that to conclude each one of these programs, we invite our speaker to, to offer a call to action, really a charge to each person in attendance to uh to really think about how we can all do something that adds to the bridge that together we are really building towards our future so with that in mind camille i'd like to ask you as we conclude our conversation this evening what is your call to action uh, to the audience tonight for everyone watching um and for our faith leaders here first of all thank you for being here and participating because the number one way that we're able to face this opioid epidemic in our country is through education and knowledge. Um, The more that we know about the experiences that people have, it will make us better allies for those people who are facing substance use disorders. Um, Kind of like we were talking about mental health, it's the idea of sometimes this is an invisible illness for people. And to understand, I know Dr. Seibert, you said in the beginning, if the one thing that people get out of tonight is to understand that addiction is a disease, that is one of the most valuable things that we can understand and learn as a society because it's going to change the whole way that we look at people who face substance use disorders, that it's not a personal failure, but something that they are struggling with and going through. And that doesn't make them any less worthy than anyone else. And we need to be the ones to come and support them. Um, So to do what we can to educate ourselves and the people around us to be able to be those support systems. And um, keep talking about it because it's not something that's going away. And in fact, in so many ways, it continues to worsen in our societies. So it's something that we need to keep talking about so we can fight this. 
Well, thank you, Camille. And really thank you for leading the conversation tonight, but thank you for your strong advocacy and, and leading these types of conversations all across our country. Um, as Miss America, really grateful to you and really proud of, of the work you are doing. And thank you to you, Dr. Hamid, Rabbi Lublina, Reverend Seibert, and, and Reverend Wrighton for the work you're doing um, to address the opioid epidemic uh, individually and collectively within your, converse, your congregations and your communities and, and all across the country as well. We're extremely grateful uh, to you for, for being part of the Clinton Foundation work, but also for the work you're doing um, uh, in your own communities. I wanna thank all of my colleagues at the Clinton Health Matters Initiative and the Clinton Presidential Center for everything you did to bring tonight's program to fruition. Uh, our sponsors, Beth and Mike Colson, and, and to all of you who have tuned in tonight to join us for this very important conversation. So we hope everyone uh, stays healthy and continues to engage with us in our work at the Clinton Foundation. Thank you again and good night. Thank you.